I hope you all know what a gift it is from the Lord that this seminary is here in this place. Uh, having, having carefully thinking men and women, having carefully thinking gospel-centered people in any location is a blessing to that location. And so I'm just thankful for these guys. It's an honor to be up here, and I, just, I will continue to now pray for God's blessings uh, on the institution here and, and really on the city and on the people of the city. So one thing I want to mention to you, just because I had some excellent questions be- between, between times, I didn't have adequate time to talk about how does the physical body relate to this diagram. So it is now my goal to get that into the third uh, session somehow, because I think that is really important. But let's continue on with our plan of action here in lecture two. So you have there on page three a quote from Pascal. What sort of monster then is man? What a novelty. What a portent. What a chaos. What a mass of contradictions. What a prodigy or genius. Judge of all things, a ridiculous earthworm who is the repository of truth. A sink of uncertainty, that's a drain by the way, a sink of uncertainty and error, the glory and the scum of the world. That last line, particularly powerful, the glory and the scum of the world. What is he getting at with that? What he's getting at is the beauty of the design that we see of our personhood as reflected of the personhood of God, okay, reflective of the personhood of God, the corruption of that is the worst possible thing you could ever imagine. So in other words, the better and more pure and more beautiful something is, the farther it falls and the more tragic is its corruption. Does that make sense? Um, Back in, the, back in the 80s, the Superman movies that my parents only let me watch parts of, I had great parents. One of them, one of, one of, one of the Supermans, I think it was two or three, was the one where uh, Superman gets some weird kind of kryptonite that doesn't like weaken him, it instead like reverses him and makes him evil, okay? And the whole movie is about how this Superman with his superpowers, right, which he once used for amazing good, you know, laser beam eyes, what's that all about? And like super strength, he can fly. He's basically invincible. I don't know why anybody even messes with him, okay? But the point is, what was once capacities that were remarkable and once used for good become all the more dangerous and tragic when they're turned and used for evil, okay? So (laughs) it's hilarious. Like the the, 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 the folks who wrote the movie probably didn't feel like he could do anything like really bad because that'd be bad for movies. So he like ripped open oil tankers and polluted like the Gulf of Mexico or something like that. It was really funny. <laughs> Just to be mean, you know what I mean? But my point is this, guys. We haven't yet addressed, we, we talked about the, the structure of the heart, okay? The dynamic structure here. But we haven't yet talked about the moral implications of it. You know, I had, a, I had a good friend who was talking through this model with me, and he, he, he said, okay, I, I'm with this model, I know where you're going, but I think something's missing from it. I said, what? He said, where's the moral aspect of it, okay? I, I think you need to have a fourth category in there where maybe you put, you just add something in here and say that there are moral things that we that we do as human beings too. So there's thinking, there's feeling, there's decision making, and then and then it's like the difference between sin and righteousness, right? The moral law. And I told him, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Okay? That's actually the mistake I think that uh, Christian integrationists want to make. Okay? By integrationists, that's just a that's just a term for folks who take a psychotherapeutic model and then they sort of see where there are touch points with truth 
and they kind of put verses into it, and they blend the two concepts of theology and this psychotherapy together. They integrate the two of them. I, I don't think that's the right model that we want to do uh, in terms of allowing Scripture to speak for itself. Rather, I'm arguing, by the way, just I should. this is an aside that's really big, so I'm going to get away from it really quick, okay? But instead of integrating, we establish our model from Scripture exclusively, and that becomes the lenses through which we read everything else, okay? So it's, I'm not saying we shouldn't read other things, but what I'm saying is we're not reading them in order to integrate them somehow conceptually into our framework. Does that make sense? Little, so I'm done with that rabbit trail. Back to here. <clears throat> Here's why this doesn't work. This is what I'm arguing, guys. You don't have, you don't, you are not a being who th has thoughts and feelings and decisions, and then you have to think about honoring God, you know, with some spiritual or moral capacity. These things are by nature moral, okay? This is a moral thing. So that really ups the ante here, guys, because what I'm saying there is your emotions are moral expressions. They're expressions of a moral being, okay? And by the way, don't take that to mean that I'm implying you can immediately control every emotion you have. That's not what I'm saying. But you are a steward of your heart. And part of your heart is expressed as emotion. So this very framework is emotional. And so what we're going to talk about in this lecture is how does, how does the or very framework is moral, I'm sorry. How does that morality play out? So here's what I'm going to introduce us with. All of the operations of the heart function according to one of two laws, one of two motives, one of two sources, okay? It functions either according to sin or according to righteousness. So what I'm not saying is that in any particular situation you're in, you only have one of two options. You can do one thing that's sin or one thing that's righteousness. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's only one of two motives that are behind everything. And by the way, you could fill in any of the binaries that Scripture gives for sin versus righteousness. There's lots of them, okay? For instance, you could also say walking by the flesh versus walking by the what? Spirit. Okay, you could, if we were in the book of Proverbs, what two things would we, would we use here? Wisdom. Yep, we, we would use, you can walk by wisdom, be marked or motivated by wisdom, or by what? Folly or foolishness. Okay, so there's, there's just tons of binaries that we can do, Tr you know, transgression versus law keeping, um, all the rest of this stuff. Okay, now, what I'm going to put here is, we operate either according to sin or according to righteousness, as I say. But how in the New Covenant, well, this has always been true in my belief of things, but especially in the New Covenant, what's front-loaded as the means by which we receive righteousness? Okay? No, we don't, we don't receive righteousness by obedience. Okay? Faith. That's exactly right. Yeah, grace is the means. Or faith is the means, grace is the motive, right? But, but so, so I'm going to put faith in here because we're going to really talk about this as a concept. So basically, the point of this lecture is going to be, we're going to talk about the differences of the shape that these two different motives have on what occurs here, okay? And what that does is it helps us, when counselees come in, or, or, or when people come in for uh, just ministry, where, when we're working with them, it helps us see that we're not merely on a sin hunt if we understand sin to be some external thing that they did that we just got to find that they haven't repented of yet. Okay? You've probably all had friends counsel you like that. Okay? So those external, individual, discrete things are sin, but I'm going to try to give you a vision for how sin actually operates dynamically. Sin operates more deeply than that. It's not just external action. It's internal motivation. Okay. 
So that's what we're going to talk about. And then I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about how righteousness by faith, when faith is operative, it then, it then plugs into this same framework of our design as human beings, and it reshapes the way we think, the things we want, and the choices then we make. So let's talk about what went wrong first. What went wrong? You know, we, human beings live their lives under constant anxiety, a, a, a threat that, that haunts their peace of mind. You know what it's like. You know what it's like to be contorted and disjuncted inside. You want things deeply, but you either can't have them, or when you get them, they're not all that great right? you felt this. You think carefully about your world, yet you never seem to arrive at any solid conclusion. We, we on the one hand, choose what we want to be, yet we never really have full choice over who we are. My point is, the human experience is, is it's fragmented. It's, it's dysfunctional. It's incomplete. It, it's conflicting. And this is the result of sin. Let's, let's actually turn to the original sin event. I want to I point out to you that Scripture, again, gives you a deep understanding of human experience in regards to everything, including sin. It's not just simplistic. It's not just seeing sin as a set of behaviors that if you avoid this particular set of behaviors, you can generally be a righteous person. In fact, before we start reading here, let me ask you something. How long can you go without sinning? How long can you go? I'll do this with my students who are in the range of like 22 to 26, okay? And a lot of them are older, but that's kind of the, the, the peak demographic. And some of these guys are like cool enough and, you know, confident enough where I'm like, okay, who can go a week without sinning? Nobody raises their hand. Who can go a day? Some of the cool guys, you know, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I read the Puritans enough. I think I can get through a day <laughs> without sinning. They, they raise their hands. Then I say, how about a morning? More hands go up. How about an hour? Almost every hand goes up. How about a minute? Every hand goes up. Uh, how about a second? Everybody like, is like, our hands are already up, but that's obvious. Okay? okay. If you define sin as a distinct external act, then that question can make sense. And maybe you could go an hour. Maybe you could go a morning. I know that I could go a morning without sinning, but I would have to be sleeping through the entire thing. Okay? okay? But, it, but, but I, would actually, I would actually suggest to you, you can't go one nanosecond without sinning in the sense, not of external action, but in the sense of your heart operating out of, the, out of uh, some form of misbelief, some misprioritization of desire, and some commitment to something that God would not have you committed to. Okay? In other words, your flesh, even as believers, our flesh is still a lot, our flesh is still active in trying to draw us away from living by the Spirit. So uh, here, here's, here's why, I, why I conclude that. It's not so you feel terrible about yourself every second. It's, it's so that you have a very clear understanding. You need the grace of the Lord Jesus every nanosecond. You have to have the grace of the Lord Jesus. There are not days where you need it less than others. Okay? So, this is an important thing to just recognize about, about sin not being merely external act, though it is, but dynamic, uh, dynamic experience. Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 did not eat the fruit because they were hungry. Did you know that? Let's just state that obviously. Okay? So the question then is, why did they eat the fruit? Specifically, what I want to look at here is, how does the narrator describe the experience of eating the fruit? Okay? So, so let me just point something out before we even dive into it. 
But do you notice that the first two chapters of the Bible cover some pretty significant events in overview form, right? The week of creation. It covers the fact that God made everything that exists, and it does everything in two chapters. I, don't you find yourself wishing we had way more chapters? Well, you're wishing for something more than the Bible than God gave you, so stop doing that. Okay, I'm just kidding. I baited you into that one. I'm just kidding. Maybe someday we'll get to know a lot more when we're with him in the heaven. But my point is, you cover a lot of material in chapters 1 and 2, and then if you actually glance at the next couple chapters after that, you cover generations and generations of people really quickly. But here in Genesis 3, you have the narrator putting the brakes on and slowing down to the point where it's actually describing the internal experience of, specifically, Eve here. It's really amazing. So, so when that happens... When biblical writers do that, you have to pay close attention to what they're wanting you to pay, pay close attention to. There's a world of theology here in Genesis 3. Let's, let's look at the text. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of, the, of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Pause there. Okay, this this is where the story gets really juicy. Literally, right? I just thought of that. That's pretty funny. Um... (laughs) But let's, let's kind of take an assessment of what's going on. What's Satan's strategy here, okay? He's particularly crafty is where this starts out. What that means is not just he's like sneaky and describing something about snakes, how they so sl- silently slither and get away. He's talking about the evil one behind the serpent is particularly strategic, okay? So what that means is this. Satan knew that in order to disrupt the relationship between man and God, he had to be crafty. He had to be strategic. He had a very carefully laid out plan. And so here he comes in, and he asks Eve a question. What's the content of the question he's asking her? He's just asking her to give a report. That's it. I'm just wondering. Just wondering. What did God say to you? And what is Eve, what's, the, what's the content of Eve's report? What does she say? Yeah, she summarizes what God said. Now, some scholars are it, some scholars think that this is an expansion of what God actually said. I tend to read it as this is just happens. The narrator put more detail in here, but Eve is as representing accurately the command that God had said to her. In other words, she knew, she showed that she understood that that tree was off limits and not meant for her consuming, okay? So let's think of our dynamic heart model here, okay? What in in Eve's experience is so far being displayed? Cognition. She had an accurate knowledge, an accurate understanding. By the way, how'd she get that knowledge? God gave it to her. Reveal it to her. This This is a little bit of an aside, but you gotta get this, guys. Notice that Adam and Eve did not come preloaded with that knowledge. That knowledge had to be transferred to them how? God spoke to them. That has vital implications for how we understand our human experience now. We're not preloaded with all that we need to know. We have to receive the words of a divine, the divine being, right, from outside of us, okay? So she... She uh, reports about what she knows to be true from God. Then we read Serpent's response. How would you characterize his response? Yeah, that's right. It's a lie. It's deceptive. That's exactly right. 
But in terms of the cognitive content, the knowledge content of what he said, how would you compare it to what she said? It's a direct contradiction. It's a direct contradiction. So here, here's the first contest here. She had certain beliefs about her world. She's had certain beliefs about that tree. She had certain beliefs about herself in relationship to that tree and thus in relationship to God. She received those beliefs from God's words, God speaking to her. Now, there's an alternate rival knowledge that is presented to her. There's a new story, a new narrative, different beliefs that directly contradict the old ones. They can't be mutually held, okay? And so, she listens to him. What, by the way, just what, what particularly was promising about this? Why does this new knowledge seem more attractive to her? It's beneficial to her because it would make her like her nature. That's right. He, 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 it was beneficial to her in some way where she received good apart or independent from her maker. Okay, So it's a totally new framework of knowledge. It's a totally new way for her to perceive herself. It's a totally new way for her to perceive this world she's living in. Okay, Now, this is amazing if we keep looking and pay attention to what the narrator wants us to pay attention to. Right after Satan says this in verse 5, look at what it says in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Pause. What's going on there? Guys, that language is charged, as you said, with affection. Desire. Okay? Delight. Desire. Longing. What's amazing to me, we know from the narration that that tree was in the middle of the garden. So what that means is Eve probably saw that tree hundreds, maybe thousands of times prior to this conversation. So she has taken in the optical information of that tree countless times before, and it did not have any effect in stirring anything within her. Desires weren't attached to it. But now that there's these new, this new framework, this new knowledge, this rival bit of belief, suddenly those desires have something to attach to. So, so what we're seeing here is that Eve was believing the testimony of the evil one more than she was believing the testimony of her creator, and that had a dynamic effect on her heart. It changed her desires. It shaped them. It warped them. It made them evaluate things that God says are not good as good. And by the way, it also made her evaluate the things that God said as good as not good, right? And then, tragically, we keep reading verse uh, same verse here. She took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. What what action? What, what's going on there in terms of the heart model? She followed suit. Volition. She made her choice. So what we see there, what's fascinating to me again, is the narrator slows us down enough to kind of give us a peek into what. Eve's going through in order to illustrate to us how sin functions. Sin functions dynamically, okay? By the way, doesn't it frustrate you with how stupid Adam was? And just like, like Eve goes through this big, dynamic, complex process, and then he, Adam's just like, okay, and he grabs some and he starts eating, okay? That's amazing. I don't, I don't know if there's a commentary there beyond. <laughs> but here's the thing, guys. Though the, the dynamic, uh, the dynamic um, experience of sin also had certain consequences and effects that are also dynamic, if you keep reading. Glance down. Just, just glance down. We won't, we won't read it as tightly here. But glance down, starting in verse 8. I'm sorry, starting in verse 7. 
And notice some of the components of things that came into their experience that were not there before. Okay? What knowledge now characterized their experience that was not there before? Throw some things out. Yeah. There, there was a knowledge of good and evil. They did gain a certain knowledge, as God told them. But that knowledge now is sort of this experiential knowledge of knowing what evil is because they've done evil. Okay, That's part of it. And that's closely related to what specific thing were their eyes open to. Verse 7. They were naked. Did they actually think they had clothes on before that? No, it's not that they didn't literally know that their skin was exposed. It's that they didn't know the significance of their skin being exposed in the particular new uh, uh, realm of a, of, a, of a world where it's unsafe to do that anymore, right? It's a knowledge of good and evil. They, they now were knowledgeable of, of this shameful thing that they had done, okay? So they had a new knowledge. They also had new experiences in their affections, too. What, was it, what were some of the new experiences you keep reading down? Just glance down. You know what happens next. Blame. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we'll get to blame. That's good. But somebody said fear first. How do you know they were scared? They tried to hide, and Adam says so. You know, <laughs> So God's like, hey, where are you guys? Why are you hiding? He's like, I was afraid. How do you even know the word? Think about this, guys. Prior to the, the fall, prior to disobedience, when Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God coming for his evening stroll with them, don't you think that filled them with delight rather than dread? It was probably the best part of their day. Now their ears are taking in that same audible information and the heart the, the affections are responding in the opposite way. It's dread and it's fear. Can you imagine being an adult and experiencing fear for the first time? We all know what fear is because we've experienced it since we were little kids. We grew up with it. But, but what I'm trying to point out here, guys, is that there are certain emotions that didn't make sense before the fall. And so this was a new experience, just like disobedience, just like this new foreign body of knowledge was new to Eve, so was the fear. And then volitionally, what did it lead to? What, what are some of the things they did? Well, the first thing they did was they covered themselves, and then they dove into the bushes. What is that an act of? It's an act of hiding, self-preservation. That's exactly right. So volitionally, they're inclined away from God. They hide from God. They are inclined away from each other. They hide from one another. There's this estrangement that becomes a law. It's a dynamic estrangement. Okay. So, so Genesis 3 teaches us that all of these things are operative with sin. So that sort of leads to the point of dynamic unfaithfulness. That's, a, that's just a different way of talking about dynamic sin. I want to square our understanding of sin. I've just found this really helpful in personal ministry to square our understanding of sin. What's the center of sin? To square it on lack of faith. Okay. Now, uh, you guys were probably raised in the uh, Augustinian tradition where if I were to ask you, what is the root or core of every sin? What would you just naturally say? Pride. That's what I hear. Pride a lot. And that, that, that comes from, from Augustine. I think, I think there's a very real sense in which that's true. Pride is always involved. And I am too young of a man to ever think about challenging St. Augustine. Okay? But what I am saying is, if you read Genesis 3, sort of, just naturally in terms of how it's described and how Satan approaches her. Yes, her pride was appealed to, okay? But what was the, what was the knife's edge of the temptation to sin? I think it was actually believe what I'm telling you instead of believing what God tells you. 
That's really where the battle lies. So I want to, I've just found it helpful uh, in, in personal ministry if whenever you're talking about sin, you're not just merely talking about it in the legal category of transgression. It is a transgression and it does apply legally. So I'm not saying don't do that. But what I'm saying is what, it, what, what that transgression flows from is you do not believe that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. That's, that's, that's the fundamental core of each one of our sins. And so that makes it a little bit more, that makes it a little bit easier for us to recognize how that fits into here. Sin is operative when I don't take God's perspective of any number of things, myself, my world, what's good, what's bad, when I don't agree with him on what is good and valuable and desirable, and instead I find other things to be good and valuable and desirable, and when I am committed to things that do not reflect the commitments of his heart, okay? I'm, I'm rejecting his testimony and his perspective. That makes it, that, that gives us something to go with, especially in counseling where sin might be involved. And when somebody hears the word sin right away, they're automatically assuming you're talking about some external act that they aren't confessing and haven't repented of. You're, you're actually giving them sort of the, the deeper uh, understanding of approaching sin. And by the way, just for time's sake, we won't go there. But Romans chapter 1 makes this very explicit, okay? Romans chapter 1 shows us, you know, you, you guys know Romans 1, 16 and 17, that the righteous shall live by faith. And then Paul immediately launches into this awful, yucky world of people who do not live by faith, but rather live by unbelief. And it says a number of different things that center around, uh, uh, that center around the different functions of the heart in terms of their corruption. They reject the words of God. They believe lies. They become hardened in their hearts. They, give their, they, they pursue the lusts and, uh, of their hearts, and God gives them over to their lusts of their heart. And then they commend those who do. They pursue those things. So it just is this uh, hardening that occurs to them. <clears throat> so that's what I mean by dynamic unfaithfulness, and I hope that's a helpful category to you. So then let's, let's move on to page four, your handout there. And let me just make a transitional point from how sin corrupts all... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should at least say this before I transition here, okay? Here's what I mean. Just sin operates dynamically. I'll give you a quick summary point. Sin corrupts the thoughts and beliefs of the heart. That's the cognitive side. Let me make a quick comment on that. What this means is in people's daily experience, they believe things that are untrue about God, about themselves, about others, about their lives. People believe that God is less glorious than he is, less relevant to their experience, less demanding of their worship, less worthy of their trust. People believe things about themselves that are distorted. They think they are more important than they actually are. Or they think that they are more hate, hateful than they act, or, 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 or hateful for different reasons than God would say he's concerned with about them. People believe also that others, in terms of relationships, are meant to serve them, that they must somehow gain their approval at all costs. People believe believe that, he, that people don't think about relationships in the way that God describes in his word, okay? So it corrupts us cognitively. Quick, quick uh, comment on the affections. Sin also corrupts the desires of the heart, resulting in feelings that don't align with God's values, okay? I would, I would venture to guess that the last time you were really angry was probably not a righteous anger, Okay, now that the I already I already I already put myself on the board, and you saw what a jerk I can be to my wife. Okay, but if you look at my anger there, the contours of my emotions did not reflect the character of God. He wasn't angry at my wife for making that comment. 
So the fact that I was angry at my wife for making that comment shows that I'm evaluating her. I'm wanting certain things from her that don't necessarily square with what God wants me to want. Does that make sense? I know there's a lot of wants in there. People were made to find joy in what God, in what God delights in, to be disgusted by what disgusts him, to be saddened by what grieves him, to be angered by what angers him, and to fear what he calls actually threatening. In other words, people's desires and the emotions that, 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 that are expressed out of these desires, they were designed to imitate God's, okay? And they don't. So one quick comment on the volition, and then we'll move on. That is the worst thing you can do as a teacher is move on and then jump back, so I'll make it quick. Sin further corrupts the commitments of the heart. People's wills are bound tight by sin, constraining our ability to choose good. Okay, So Martin Luther was brilliant for calling this the bondage of the will. Okay, We are bound to sin. Before Christ, in your natural state, you have two choices. You can either sin or you can sin worse. Okay, Those are your choices. Okay, You're bound by that. That's what sin does to us. The, the commitments that our hearts should have, they don't have. So, what hope do we have in this state? Now back to dynamic restoration. <clears throat> and here I want to make the point that redemption is not just the fact that on some future day of judgment, you will stand before an almighty God on a blazing white throne and He will have every right to condemn you forever. And yet, His Son Jesus Christ steps in and says, I have united myself to that sinner and therefore He shares in my righteousness. And they, He welcomes you in. Guys, that's glorious. That's absolutely glorious. But redemption is not just for that future day. That future day has massive implications now in your present experience. And so, just like sin operates dynamically, I'm going to, I, I want to try to show you that righteousness by faith now plugs into the structure of who we are and begins to change everything. Righteousness functions dynamically. And it occurs through faith. So you have that paragraph there. Faith in Christ is the means by which the dynamic heart is restored to do what it was designed for, to worship God in thought, desire, and choice. Faith is how a heart receives the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that righteousness retakes control of the dynamic design, restoring the beauty of its ability to worship God. So you remember what I said. All of this beautiful complexity was meant to worship God. Guess what? You can't do it unless you have come to Christ by faith. So, really what I want to do here, if we looked at Genesis 3 as the dynamic failure of human beings, if we ask the question, okay, where do we look for the dynamic success of human beings, the restoration of human beings, we actually have to look at the experience of Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ, do you know this? Jesus Christ didn't just die for your sins. He lived to be qualified to be the sacrifice to die for your sins. So his life is the theological groundwork and example of what ours should look like, not just because we picture Jesus sometimes as like a soft-spoken person who never did like external sins. Yeah, that's true. He never did external sins, but... There was a, rea a dynamic reality to this that is, that is equally as remarkable by the fact that he never externally sinned. He never internally sinned. Okay? And so when we look at the operations of his heart, we learn a lot. So, so one of the keenest passages where we get that peak is Mark chapter 14. Turn there with me, please. And I'm going to Mark 14 because this is, this is the Garden of Gethsemane scene. And, and the writer of Hebrews refers to this particular stage of Jesus' life as the, exemplar, as the exemplar of faith. Okay, Do you remember, do you know Hebrews chapter 11, 
the hall of faith by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Do you know how Hebrews then 12 starts is? It's an admonition to run this race, to incur it, to, to, to set off the things that hinder us. Looking to Jesus, who is the two things about your faith. Do you remember this? You guys are well taught, praise God. The author and the finisher of our faith. Okay? So, notice how faith is front-loaded here. Okay? The writer of Hebrews is saying, do you want to you live rightly in your world? Do you want to make it to the better country? You have to live by faith. And Jesus is the groundwork of your faith. What's an author and what's a finisher? What's being emphasized there? Yeah, the author is somebody who starts it, and the finisher, well, it's already in there. <laughs> somebody who finishes it. So from A to Z, Alpha to Omega, 1 to 100, Jesus is the platform of your faith. He was the example of it. And so let's look at what faith looks like dynamically in the heart of a human being who honored God in everything that he did. Mark chapter 14. So the particular context of this, you know, is Gethsemane as he prepares for the cross. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and, to, remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Let's think about this dynamically. What, what stands out as most obvious? Of, of these categories, what's kind, of, what's kind of most colorful and vivid for you as you read that narrative? Which, which area jumps out first? The affections. What was, what was Jesus' emotive state like? Sorrow. Why was he so sad? Sorrowful. In Luke, there's a couple occasions where the word... The English word is used distressed, okay? It's like, a, it's like a heaviness. Dare we use the word anxiety, okay? If Jesus really trusted God, why was he sad? Yeah, but if he really trusted that was the best plan, then why is his emotions displayed like this? Is this a lack of faith in Jesus? We better not ever say that, friends. We better not ever say that. So you know what that leaves us? Sorrow and distress can be an act of faith. When you grieve, here's, here's the litmus test. When an emotion matches an appropriate emotion in God's perspective of a situation, then you know it's accurate. Or let me give you a little bit more there. Okay? So feelings, I'm going to use this guy here. Feelings are the outflow of desires. So the accuracy of a feeling is directly contingent on the accuracy of the desire. Somebody said it well. What Jesus was feeling sorrow. That's grief. Grief is, is, is uh, uh, the, the perceived loss of something valuable. Okay? What is it that he was perceiving he was losing? Fellowship. Fellowship with God. I have a question for you. Is fellowship between the first person and the second person of the eternal trinity a valuable thing? You better believe it. The intra-Trinitarian love is the basis of all goodness and all love and all relationship that we know. It is not just a good thing. It is the best thing. Okay? So, sorrow, grief, is an expression of the fact that Jesus deeply valued fellowship with his Father. So, that's why we say Jesus was honoring God 
in his sorrow here. That wasn't him just trying to like being tempted to not believe God and then he gets it all together and somehow he avoided sin by the, by the skin of his teeth. That's not what this is. His sorrow actually is an aspect of his faith, okay? But that's not the whole story. What, what cognitively is going on here? What knowledge content do we see displayed in Jesus' thinking as he makes his prayer to God? That, that we're going to get there. That's, that's the culmination. Amen. But he says something before. Yeah. What does he say? Everything is possible with you. Yeah. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Is that an accurate understanding of who God is? You better believe it. But, but what's even more instructive for us is not just that Jesus had good theology here. It's that the entire basis of his appeal to God was theology. It, it prioritized the knowledge of God, his experience of it. He always had God first and foremost in his mind. His beliefs and his knowledge of God shaped his perception of the changing circumstances around him, including this garden he was in and including the cross he was going to face the next day. So Jesus was worshiping God with his affections. Jesus was worshiping God with his mind, and then what does that lead to? Well said here, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There has not been an act of faith that remarkable in the history of the world. Volitionally, he submitted his will to God's will. His commitment to honor and obey his Father's plan of saving sinners was greater than his commitment to preserve his own life, which itself was eternally valuable. Right? So what we see here is that faith faith functions dynamically. And Jesus did that for you. Jesus did that for me. And because he did that, and because I'm saved in that, and you're saved in that, then that now becomes a possibility in your heart too, whereas before it was not. So, our faith must be understood dynamically as well. That's the heart's dynamic faith is your next heading. We'll just sort of quickly move through these. It's a thinking faith. Okay, you, can look, you can read those bullet points for yourself, but on page five, let me just move through these. It's a thinking faith. Here's what I mean by that. By faith, people begin to see the world as God sees it, to interpret and understand the world from God's eyes. God grants Christians the mind of Christ so that they can discern spiritual truths that they were incapable of discerning before. That's the whole point of 1 Corinthians 2. Okay, where you hear this language of the mind of Christ. Okay? It's not some weird thing where like you're walking and all of a sudden you have a brain replacement and Jesus' first century uh, uh, Near Eastern brain gets plugged into yours and all of a sudden you're not you anymore. That's not what's going on. What it's saying is you have a capacity of knowledge that belonged to Jesus and he shares it with you. And when that when that increasingly influences your perceptions, you start reading and seeing situations differently. So a couple who doesn't know the Lord and experiences the loss of their two-year-old child and a couple who does know the Lord and experiences the loss of the two-year-old child, they're, they're both going to feel grief. Don't act like faith means not grieving because, again, similar to this, the feelings of grief show the value of the child right? It would be inappropriate to not feel grief. But the difference is they grieve with a new set of knowledge to it. A Christian knows this isn't the end. We're not just piles and masses of cells. That child has an eternal existence that, per, that goes beyond the, the, little, the little girl's body. And not only that, I have a God who has done what's necessary to bring about a world where this type of stuff never happens again through his son. That's a knowledge that then, once it's plugged in to your soul, your heart, your mind, 
you then read and respond to the situation of a child's death in a fundamentally different way. It's a thinking faith. As Paul describes also in 2 Corinthians there, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ shines into our hearts. We are able to perceive and understand Scripture, and we are able to make the connections between the principles and the knowledge we have from Scripture in our actual daily experiences. It's also a desiring faith. Faith introduces a new set of values that control all other values. A new set of desires that control all other desires. You know, so in my context teaching, uh, you know, 20, 20 mid tw- people in their mid-20s quite a bit, they often are reading John Piper and they're reading all the Desiring God stuff and they're coming in and they're saying to me, I'm really scared, Dr. Pierre, because I don't desire God alone. I have other, I, 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 I you know, I, I like food. I desire, I desire hanging out with my friends. You know, uh, they're not talking about sinful desires, though they have those. They're, they're saying they're concerned that, that God isn't the exclusive desire of their heart. Okay? And what, I, I'm bringing this up to just bring a point of clarity. I don't think what we're saying here is that when righteousness plugs into the heart, that God then, in the affections, God then is the exclusive and only desire so that all other desires are, kept, are, are cut off. That's not how you think of it. God is the control desire that determines the priority and shape of all the des- other desires that go under it. Okay? There's a difference conceptually in what I'm saying. So what that means is, I think when you guys get excited about Michigan football winning, that surprises me. I can't understand it personally, okay? But I don't think that's a sinful or wrong thing, okay? In other words, to desire them to win is not something that is contradictory to a desire for God, though people from Ohio would probably say so, okay? But what it can do, where it does go wrong, and you've probably experienced this in your own life, okay, or seen people who experience this, where it can go wrong is when that becomes the control desire that bumps the desire for God to a subset. And you know how you can gauge whether that's happened or not? How much domination it has over your emotions? Okay. So some of you, if Michigan loses th- that particular Saturday, you're a jerk to your family. Okay. <laughs> It's amazing to me. I have a, I have a friend who ministers in, um, chat, uh, in um, oh man, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And after the Iron Bowl the, between Alabama and Auburn, if it doesn't go their way, church attendance is markedly down. It's amazing. Isn't that amazing? So, so uh, let's, let's just condemn all those Southerners. As, <laughs> but, no, I'm just kidding. But my point is this. It's not wrong to have desires attached to the things of this earth. In fact, if you didn't, that would be a problem. But it's uh, the control desire is God. You want Him more than anything. And so faith becomes operative when in suffering, you can, you can mourn oppression, okay? You can mourn the difficulties that are happening to you, but, they, but, but you desire God as the refuge and the way you understand and respond to those things. In distress, right, when, when things are threatening you, guys, we have genuine threats that come and, 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 they, and, they, and they bring up the emotion of fear or distress in us. Believers express their fear to God and anticipate relief from Him according to His timing and His way. There's a settledness that comes there. The things that we were once disgusted by, Maybe, as we come to see that actually those things are more honoring to God than, I, than, than just my personal preferences we're seeing, maybe we become less disgusted by them. And then contrary, the things that we once were really comfortable with watching or seeing or talking about, the, the deeper we grow in faith, the more disgusted we are by things that disgust God, right? 
I experienced this recently where I'm not going to even say the movie because I don't want us to get into a debate on whether this movie is okay to watch or not, but it's one of those that's like, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not. There's a particular movie that I watched in college, and I remember laughing it up with my friends and loving the movie and thinking it was, you know, just the greatest thing ever. And then, you know, 15 years later, a couple, couple months back, uh, my wife and I saw that it came up on Netflix as, you know, a, a movie because it's so old. We're like, you know what? That was a great movie. Let's watch it. We turned it on. I got through seven minutes and I felt so heavy. And then we turned it off. Okay? I think part of that, now I, you guys know what a sinner I am. I told you the story. Okay? But I think part of that is this gracious work of sanctification of God in my life to where my desires, I think, are a little bit closer to where his desires are. And so my emotional responses maybe, maybe, hopefully, are a little bit closer than his. I, I didn't want to take delight in that anymore. I wanted to be, I wanted, I wanted to, I, or I was disgusted by it. So these new, these new uh, desires take control of us. One thing, one last thing I'll point out here in the desires, just to, for reference, is Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. Just write that down. Let me read it for you, and I want to point out one thing, and then we'll move to the last point here. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the, for the, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Here's what I'm pointing out. It's not the desires of the flesh versus the Spirit. That's not the language Paul's using. It's the desires of the flesh versus the desires of the Spirit. Why is that significant? Because when you're, when you're seeking to be conformed to Christ, sometimes I hear believers talk as if what that means is we try to cut off that part of our design. So sometimes... Good advice like, don't listen to your emotions, listen to the Word of God. That's, that's actually, I know what people mean by that, and that's fantastic advice. Because what it's saying is, you can't make decisions based on how you feel in the moment. You have to make it on conviction. Amen. But, if that's all we're saying, then we might be implying that then, therefore that means the Christian life is ideally just operating out of these, and not that. Okay? But the way I see Scripture talk about us is, is God claims all of it, right? So if you don't feel very much desire for God, what that means is, it, it's not that you're not desiring anything, okay? You are a creature of desire. It means that you're directing those desires in other ways. So if you want increased desire in God, you have to undermine the, the, the efforts you're putting into cultivating desires and other things, okay? So for some of you, that means as football season comes around, just to use that example again, I've had to do this with Ohio State football, which would surprise you, but there have been certain seasons where I was like, you know what, I got absolutely captured last year. I'm not going to read about Ohio State football during the weekdays anymore because then when I go to watch the game, I'm less aware of all the nuances and all of the things, and I'm less charged and emotionally invested in it. And I even would force myself to skip a number of them because it's had such a powerful draw over me at that particular season of my life, right? And I was trying to steward my desires with the glory of God. You all think I'm crazy. Okay. <laughs> Finally, it's a committed faith. Faith inserts new control commitments too. So along with control beliefs and control values, faith also has control commitments. The Holy Spirit frees people to obey God willingly, whereas before they didn't have the choice to, or the option to. So, I am over time. We are going to apply this to our friend diagnosed with binge eating disorder to start out our next session.